Amen. Because we know that sometimes you can't reach the pastor, sometimes you can't reach your mama, can't reach your daddy, but you can always reach Jesus. So you need, since you know that, and, and, and the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, and the Holy Spirit will honor God's word that's on the inside of you. So we thank God for you coming to the house of God tonight. Tonight, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the first Corinthians. All right. Chapter number 12. And we're going to read verse 1. And I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the King James Version. I can go to the New King James Version. Let's do that because I'd rather have it in the New King James Version, this particular verse. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. So the topic that we're teaching on tonight is concerning spiritual gifts. We have been teaching in the past a good bit about growing up in the Lord so that we will know how to inherit our inheritance that God has given us <clears throat> as children of God. And that's in uh, Galatians 4. And it says, as long as you are a baby, even though you are an heir, you still won't be able to receive your inheritance until you reach a proper growth level. And so we've been teaching about growing in the Lord. We've been teaching about being prepared to receive your inheritance. Because, see, we're, we're sons and daughters of king. God is a king. Did you know that? Amen. The Bible says he's the king. Jesus is the king of kings. And if he is the king of kings, who is he the kings of? See, so that made us kings. And when you are a king, you have a dominion a, a do, where, you, where you are in charge or where you are. But you got to grow up to the point where you can be the king that you need to be and dominate over your uh, over the authority that you have. Now, our confidence is in God. We've been teaching that. And so this is kind of building up from what we've been teaching on. So our confidence is in God. So we put our faith in him. But our part is to work. And we've been teaching on three things that we always stay on here at, uh, at Evergreen. And that's we focus on unity, we, yoke, we focus on service, and we focus on love. If we get those three things in line, the devil can't stop us because God said where there's unity, that he commands the blessing. And the blessing is the supernatural empowerment that God put on your life that calls you to be blessed and to cause you to receive the, um, the blessings, the things that come from being blessed is a supernatural anointing. So when we dwell together in unity, God commands the blessing. And Satan works through division. God works through unity. We all have the same vision. That's why we do our vision statement in the church. You know, God give a different vision to different ministries because he don't need every ministry doing the same thing. He don't. I mean, there are some ministries that focus on, uh, on, 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 on giving clothes and things like that, providing for the poor. And there are some ministries that spend a lot of time on evangelism, going over to Africa and things like that. And there are some ministries that focus on um, different things, on youth. They might somebody focus on old people. But you need to find out what your job is. God, we don't need everybody doing one thing. We don't need everybody working on trying to take care of old folk. We don't need everybody trying to take care of the young folk. We don't need everybody going over to Africa. Everybody, God has set in a church, he gives different visions to whoever the visionary is in that church, and then you work toward that. As far as, as, uh, as, as going over to Africa, I don't have no desire to do that. But I know it's important that we help feed those people. So our church, whether you know it or not, our church so into a ministry that goes over in Africa and help other people. So our church, we don't we don't have a clothing, uh, what you call it, a, a clothing place for everybody to come and get free clothing and everything. But we support other people. That's what we have our benevolent fund. Our benevolent fund is to help people that are in need. Our benevolent fund in this church is set aside differently from our regular church treasure and the
fund is used to help people that are in need, in genuine need. And like Sister Anderson said, we will examine, we will check it out because I know that some people, that that's how they make their living. It's just going from church to church. They don't try to work. But see, we, we have to find out the people that are genuine, genuine need, and so we do it. But we found out, we do our vision. That's why we say our vision statement, our goals, our mission. Well, all those things keep us on track. And it's the same way in the body of Christ. God don't want everybody doing the same thing. We need ushers, but we don't need everybody to usher. Amen. We need people to sing in the choir, but we don't need everybody to sing in the choir. See, and so we have different ministry gifts in the body of Christ, but we all have the same vision. We all have the same goal. At the end of the day, we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. Somebody asked me uh, a few days ago about the ministry of armor bearer. How many of y'all familiar with that? People say, armor bearers in church? Okay, that person asked me, well, is that a, a ministry or is that something that we just do in the church? Well, before we get through with this, you'll know the answer, okay? <laughs> all right. Okay. So we know all know that God has called us to serve in his kingdom, and God multiplies the works of our hands, not just our good intentions of what we think should be done, but it's what you do that God multiplies. And everybody in the ministry has a ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, it makes an analogy of the church with the human body. Everybody part has a purpose. Everybody part has an assignment. Christ is the head of the church. We are the body. Now the arms that are on the body are not designed to do what the legs are designed to do. And the hands are not designed to do what the feet are designed to do. Every part has a purpose. And if every part does what God designed it to do, then the body will be successful and it will prosper and it will grow. After we are united with the same vision, the same purpose, and the same goals, we need to know that everybody in the ministry or everybody in the body has an assignment. If you are saved, God has a purpose for you in the body of Christ. There is an assignment, and you have been gifted to do something in the body of Christ that's going to benefit the whole body. So everybody in the ministry has a ministry. See, uh, they say, well, this is Pastor Anderson's church. I don't really like that term because Pastor Anderson don't have no church. Amen. Pastor Anderson is just a steward over God's church. Amen. He's just a pastor in God's church. And I know a lot of times pastors use that term loosely, and I don't get mad with them about doing it, but we need to realize that the church belongs to God, and we're just workers together to do what God has called us to do. Amen. So uh, we are not all called to do the same thing, and in this ministry we have one pastor. Amen, amen, amen. And if too many people are trying to pastor the church, you're going to have confusion, and you're going to have a, a lot of different visions and goals, and you're not going to have unity in the body of Christ. Now, there are some ministries that they have multiple pastors. They use that title because in our ministry, we have ministry group leaders. Uh, we are divided up into like nine different ministry groups, and actually, each ministry group leader is sort of is supposed to be sort of like a, a pastor or under the pastor in that group because see we know that God is going to bless us to become like a um, a 500 um, ministry 500 occupy about 500 people in this ministry and in this little small area we live that that's a lot of people and so the pastor cannot know everybody personally as the ministry grows like right now I know almost everybody. Um, by name, just about this, you know, it's a part of the ministry. But as the ministry grow, then it's going to be, be beyond my capacity to know everybody. But if you have ministry group leaders and we put people on a ministry team, then you ought to at least get to know the people that's in your ministry group. See, and so, the, the, so those team leaders are actually sort of like little pastors over that particular group under the pastor. See, and so that's why we're trying to get it motivated now. That's one of the hardest things that we've been able to get going like it's supposed to be in, the, in Evergreen Church. We have a lot of ministries and a lot of ministries do the same thing. And I'm just going to put, I'm, I'm just going to pin this flower right now. Uh, we had a, a, a conference dealing with 
the different ministries and the purposes of each ministry and the duties of each ministry. And I'm just going to pin this flower right now on our usher board. Our usher board is the ministry that is a good example for all the other ministries. Now, I'm just saying that's what it is. They, they do what they're supposed to do, and they operate in, in, in unity. They operate in unison. They do what they are supposed to do. And, the, and we got other ministries that are working toward that, too. We got other ministries that are doing good. But right now, I'm just going to give them, y'all doing a great job. And I thank God for y'all. Now, my assignment in the ministry is pastor-teacher. And I don't, I've been pastoring now for like 28 years, over 28 years. And in the last four or five years, I learned what my place is in the church. Because when I first came here, I did everything. I mean, I did the yard work. I did the repairs. Before Brother Sullivan came and stuff, I'd do the work on the repairs and whatever was done. And when it came down to the sound system, and I would, I would do everything. You know, we had a small ministry, and so I couldn't just say, well, hey, this is my job, and I'm not doing it. Everything had to be done, so I had to do what I had to do. But I found out that if I start doing something, then somebody else will come alongside yeah. and help me to get it done. Yeah. But now, since God has raised the ministry to the area or to the where it is right now, I don't hardly know anything about the sound system because that's somebody else's assignment. Amen. That's not my assignment. And God let me know if I work in my assignment as pastor teacher then the ministry will begin to grow if I do my job. Now, see, the thing is, I can do many things in the ministry. I can lead praise and worship. Y'all know that? Yeah. I can't do it as good as they do, <laughs> but I can do it. And I used to do that. Amen. Whenever we got up, when church got started, because I, I, I've always been a, a stickler for being on time. And if they don't be here one time for praise and worship, I'll break out and start singing a song. And, and, and so I, I, I can do it, but I shouldn't have to do it because there are other people that can do it better than I can, and they are assigned to do it. Amen. So I can do many things in the ministry, but if I can just focus on spending my time and my effort on pastor teacher, I can get more done, and the ministry will be better. Yeah. As a pastor, my assignment is not to do everything, but to look among the people and recognize their gifts and their assign, and then assign them to do what God has equipped them to do. And then I need to step back, because that's one thing that's hard for a pastor time, to step back and let somebody else do it. Because, see, you see what needs to be done, and you know how you want it to be done, and then when you get somebody else in there and they get trained, you expect them to do it like you did. And it's hard sometimes to just turn it loose. And just because somebody doesn't do it like you do it don't mean they're not doing it right. So you got to learn how to step back and let somebody else do it. But I learned in all these, when I first became a pastor, I used to go to a lot of um, leadership meetings in, in big churches and things like that. And I found out that you need to be to the point where you can, that people will do not what's expected, but what's inspected. Amen. See, you give them the job and then you sit back and you inspect how they do it. Not trying to be a, a, a helicopter inspector, you know, but you let them do it, and if the way they're doing it is working, then you leave it alone and let them do it. But if what they're doing is not working, then it's your job to come in and try to help make correction. Now let me show you. Uh, I'm just talking about me and talking about the, the job as a pastor right now. If y'all will turn to the book of uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Some people think they want a pastor because they look like it's glamorous, but if you're not called to be a pastor, you don't need to mess with that. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and, and let's look at verse number 2, just one verse. And I want that in the King James Version, uh, Deacon. I want it in the King James Version, because I like the way he said it. Now, see, what happened is Apostle Paul, the ministry of an apostle is to go out and establish churches where there may not be a church already established, like Bishop um, Swenson. Bishop Swenson has an apostolic anointing on his life. Yeah. He, the Lord touched him. He went to Pearson and started a ministry, and that ministry grew, and he turned it over to somebody else. He went to Waycross and started a ministry there, 
And after he got that ministry started and everything going, he gave it over to somebody else. Now he went to uh, another scripture, and another ministry in Jacksonville, established another ministry in Jacksonville. And he just kind of be over that one, but it has another person as a pastor. So that's the work of an apostle. So Apostle Paul, he will go around in these different towns or different cities and different places and establish churches. But once he get the churches established, then he would ordain elders and deacons and bishops and such as that in order to carry on the work. Then he go on to another place. Well, in Ephesus, he left this young preacher called Timothy. Timothy was a young man. He was a young preacher. But Paul left him in church in charge of the ministry. And so he gave him some instructions. And look at it, verse number two. These are instructions that he told Timothy. He said, preach the word. Not what you think, not what you feel, not, not traditions. He said, preach the word. Then he said, be instant. What is instant? That, that means be right away, right? Okay, he said, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. In season, out of season, that means what? That's all the time, ain't it? Because it's always either going to be in season or out of season. So he said, preach the word. In other words, preach the word at all times. Now look at this part. Reprove, rebuke, <coughs> exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what Mr. Google said. Mr. Google said, reprove means to reprimand or censure. He said that rebuke means express sharp disappointment or criticism. And exhort means strongly encourage. So now that pastor is supposed to be able to rebuke, he's supposed to be able to reprove, and he's supposed to be able to exhort. Yeah. Now nobody have any problem with you when you exhort. <laughs> nobody have a problem when you're giving them a pat on the back. But when you start criticizing or you start rebuking, now you got a problem. And a lot of people get offended and leave the ministry. But the Bible says well, that's what you're supposed to do. If you can't do it, you ain't got no business pastoring. Amen. Amen. And that means it ain't no easy job, it ain't no good job. But you, you got to put be to the point where your desire to do what God tell you to do the way God tell you to do it above pleasing people. That's one of the things a lot of pastors have problems now because they're people pleasers. And you can't please everybody. No. You got to have a standard. And in this church, our standard is excellence. So we work up to it. And we know we, know we got to work on all the different areas, but sometimes you just got to say something. Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Sister Anderson. Because, <laughs> see, she knows. Now, I, I depend on, it's certain people in this ministry I depend on more than I do other people. And she one of them. But she know I don't change the right and wrong because she's my wife. If it's wrong, I tell my wife, hey, we need to. Now, see, the thing is you need to learn how to do it in love. See, the thing is learn how to do it in love. You never do it because you say I'm the pastor and you do what I say. You don't do it. And you have a purpose. When you do it. And, and I was taught, and I, and I live by this too, I try to. There's a time that you need to rebuke and chastise a person in private. And there's a time that you need to do it in public. See, and you need to know the difference. If I have a problem with Minister Van, I can get her in my office and we can talk about it. But if the problem I got with Sister Van is the same problem with Sister Jan, same problem with Tracy. Same problem with Sister Ann. I need to bring that thing out of the open because they don't tell how many other folks do. But no matter how many people are affected by that one deed. See? And all the time you got to know you got to do it in a pastorly way. You got to do it in love. You don't do it to hurt nobody's feelings. But sometimes you have to say some things that's not pleasant. That's a part of being a pastor. I don't like it because I like to always tell people how good they're doing. Okay. So every minute, every work in the ministry. God has, or God will anoint somebody to do it. And that's why, in addition to unity, God has let us know that we are called to serve. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus lets us know in Matthew chapter 20 that in order to become part of the kingdom of God, 
is to, to become great in the kingdom of God is to serve and to glorify God without a service. So what we do is uh, we realize that everything we do is supposed to be to the glory of God. And if I'm doing what I do to the glory of God and you're doing what you're doing to the glory of God, we can come together in unity because we have a common goal. But if I'm doing something to get a pat on the bike and you're doing something to get your pat on the bike, we're going to have competition among us and we're going to have division among us. That's why when somebody else goes up, somebody else do something, always exhort them, always encourage them. Because like if you're on a team and you go to the Super Bowl and they win, if you don't ever get off the bench, you get a ring. Yeah, you're a Super Bowl champ just because you're a part of the team. <laughs> Amen. So whenever things start going great and people start talking about Evergreen and how the Lord is blessing us and the Lord is blessing us in such a great way, uh, financially, spiritually, attendance, everything is growing in the ministry. Amen. And so when you do that, everybody is say, yeah, that's the church I go to. Amen. But now they get a bunch of scandal going on. Nobody wants you then. So what we have to do is we have to try to exalt one another, try to lift up one another, and try to encourage one another. So the apostle Paul, when he was telling Timothy that, he was not, let me read that scripture. Did I read that jumping off scripture? Okay, let's go to it. 1 Corinthians 12. Because that's really my jumping off scripture. Everything I say right now is sort of like a review. And, and one, I thought I read that. Okay, anyway, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, see, he was not trying to insult the people when he said that, but ignorance does not mean stupid. Amen. It's different between being stupid and being ignorant. Ignorance simply means not to know. Amen. I don't know. It's a, um, a writer, Mark Twain. Martin Twain say everybody ignorant just on different things. Because yeah. you might be smart on this, but you might not know nothing about that over there. So we have, all have some error. But Paul say concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. And ignorant does not mean that you can't know. It doesn't mean that you can't learn. It just means you have not learned. And so that's why he is letting them know, I'm going to talk to you about spiritual gifts because the spiritual gifts is important in the body of Christ because we do everything we do to the glory of God. And I didn't give them this scripture, but it's going to tell you what it says. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God lets us know that the lack of knowledge can cause destruction because that's what ignorance is. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge in a certain area. And so in Hosea, it says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, just because they didn't know. Now, over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 13, it lets us know that God said his people are led into captivity because they have no knowledge. So lack of knowledge can lead you into captivity. A lack of knowledge can lead you into destruction. And knowledge of God and the things of God, when applied in our life, can lead us into victory. It can make us overcomers. It can cause us to be blessed, going out, blessed coming in. It can cause us to go from poverty to prosperity. It can cause us to go from sickness to health. All that comes through knowledge of the word of God. And so when you get to know the word of God, that's a benefit for you. Because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. But the promises of God are given to us by grace. God just gives it to them. But God does not manifest it. Promises of God are manifested according to your faith. And faith is based on knowledge. One of my favorite uh, TV shows a long time ago was uh, Big Valley. Any of y'all ever remember that? It's a Western. Uh, my favorite character on Big Valley was Heath. Yeah, Heath was my favorite on that. Because, see, Heath didn't grow up with the rest of the family. And he didn't find out that he was an heir until after the daddy died. But as soon as he found out he was an heir, <laughs> he jumped on his horse and he went. And he started claiming his stuff. And he had to fight for what was his. But he made up in his mind, it's mine. And that's what we got to do. See, as long as you don't know, then you'll be without when God have made you to the point where he said, I'll meet all your needs. 
There's a place in the Bible say if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, how can you delight yourself in the Lord until you know what delights the Lord? See? And so you could be doing without whenever you could be having whatever you need. All of your needs are met. God said, I meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you get the word on the inside of you. He said, if you abide in me, that means you stay in Christ. You hold on to him through temptation, trials, and tests. You hold on to him. He said, if you abide in me, don't turn and go back into the world because things get hard. He said, abide in me. Stay, remember who you are. Abide in me. And then he said, and then after you abide in me, get my word in you. Go to church. <laughs> go to Bible study. Read the word. Be where you can hear the word of God called faith come by hearing. He said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, he said, ask what you will. Yeah, now that's awesome. Yeah. Ask what you will. And then he said, and it shall be done unto you. But you got to remain in the will. And see, like last time, I didn't get a chance to do it when I was teaching on last week. And I wanted to get to that part, but I, I, I ran out of time because see, the thing about Bible study, I know I only got about 30 minutes, so let y'all go home, because I want y'all to go home and get a good night rest and get them to go to work, uh, whatever you have to do. But anyway, it's, I, I believe that scripture was like Hebrews 12. I don't remember exactly where it's at now, because it, it says, through faith, follow them that believe through faith and patience have received the promise. Do y'all know where that's at right quick? It's 12, and I believe it's 12 and 1, but I don't remember exactly what scripture it was. But it was saying, follow them who through faith and patience have uh, received the promise, or who inherit the promises. So what it is, we were teaching you, you got to have faith. Faith is what? Faith is confidence in God. Faith is knowing the word of God, believing the word of God, and then doing the word of God. That's what faith is. But if, even after you have done it, because we went and looked at Hebrews 10, 36. He said, after you have done the will of God, you have need of patience that you might receive. So you, you got to have the kind of faith that will hold on until the manifestation of the promise of God. What is it? Hebrews 6 and 12. Hebrews 6 and 12. Uh, can you put that up right quick? I, need, I might can go to it. Hebrews 6 and 12. I like that. Because that's what I wanted to get on last week, but I didn't get to it. I just, just figured I could tie it in some kind of way. But you got to get your faith to the point where it can abstain, it can endure hardship. It can endure obstacles. It can endure the things that, that make it look like God's word not true. That's why you got to, you can't afford to look at everything. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, say we, we look not at the things which are seen. Because everything I see is temporary. That means it is subject to change. The bad thing that's going on with me today, I can't focus on that. I'm going to focus on what God said, because that bad thing that's bad for me today, God will work that thing out. He'll work it together for my good. Amen. Amen. The, the, the thing that the devil sent to destroy me, God will use it to raise me up. Amen. Turn it into a stepping stone. The stone that the devil tried to throw at you to destroy it, God will take that same thing and turn it into a stepping stone. I thought about um, a long time ago during the civil rights uh, George Wallace was the governor of Alabama. And I know y'all probably heard about this. These little, little black girls wanted to go to this white school. And segregation was, uh, segregation had been turned where they couldn't tell you what school to go to. But tradition had it where we were still going white, going to whites, and blacks going to blacks. But George Wallace didn't want these little girls to come into the school. So he called out the National Guard. He called out the National Guard to stand and guard the doors so the little girls couldn't come to school. I believe at that time, Lyndon Baines Johnson was the president. Now the very same National Guard <laughs> that the governor called to stop the children from going in, the president overrode him and took them same, those same National Guard 
and say, you better open the door and let them come in. Amen. So the same force that the governor had to carry the children out, God used those same people to help them to go in. That's the way to don't, don't, don't worry about it when the devil try to trap you and to try to trick you and bring all kind of stuff before you. That's, you know what you need to do? This is a problem for God. Amen. Amen. When things get too big for you, you need to pass on to somebody bigger than you. Amen. And that's God. Yeah. The Bible says nothing is impossible for him. So you learn how to trust God. And not only that, you have to have enough faith to trust God when you're going through the hard times. You know, I heard somebody say the darkest time of night is, 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 is uh, right before daylight. I don't know about that or not, but I know if you hold on through the darkness after a while, daylight going to show up. Amen. And that's the same way it is. Whenever you're going through, it might be dark. It might seem like you're not going to make it. But if you hold on to God during the dark time, God will bring some light. Amen. God, do You hold on to God during the time of captivity, and God will give you some victory. Amen. Just stay with God. Your situation might be bad now. But if you hold on, if you hang on, if you don't get, keep praying for that husband. Keep praying for that wife. Keep praying for those children. Don't throw them away. And just wait on God to deliver them. And you know what? While you're waiting on God, they might get worse. And you start getting discouraged. Lord, the more I pray for this person, the worse off they get. Don't worry about that. Don't look at that. You look at what God says. Amen. You focus on what God says. Amen. Sister Van. That's Hebrews 10 35. Okay, yeah. But I want, want the one I wanted was the one about uh, through faith and patience. Okay. Yeah, we looked at that. It said that you be not sluggish, but imitate. I think I got stuck on sluggish last week. Okay. He said, do not become sluggish because we got a lot of that in the problem in the church. But I thank the Lord for the people that Evergreen, they hear the word, they believe the word, and they change according to the word. Praise That's what Evergreen is. Amen. All right? Okay. And he says, but do what? Imitate those who through what? Faith, Faith and patience inherit the promise. So you not only have to have faith, you got to have the faith that will carry you through. See, we're not talking about no little bit of faith. We're not talking about weak faith. We're talking about strong faith. We are talking about great faith, the kind of faith that will carry you through when hardships come into your life. Because whether you are saved or unsaved, you're going to have some hardships. Amen. Whether you're saved or unsaved, you're going to get attacked by the devil. And then when I used to be going to firstborn, I was a deacon. One of my favorite hymns, I don't remember all of it, but one of the verses was, Must I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Then the next verse says, Sure I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I will bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by your word. Just because you say don't mean everybody going to like you. Just because you say don't mean everybody going to treat you right. And just because you say that don't mean things going to be fair. Amen. But that ain't fair. And then you walk around whining and the devil looking at you, laughing at you. Uh, that ain't fair. I, I, they didn't treat me right on the job. They gave somebody a promotion, and I know I should have got it. But don't worry about it. Take care. We was um, at a funeral. Good God, my time is already up. And, and a funeral, and I ain't got on the gifts yet. In a funeral on Saturday, and the, and the preacher, she read over at, uh, in St. John where God said, let not your heart be troubled. And she said, all that simply means is don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Whatever it is, learn to cast your cares on the Lord. He know for you. He care for you. And the more you trust God, the more you'll see your faith begin to work. And the more your faith begin to work, the more you see things change. All right. I, I didn't get a chance to get over to it. I knew I wasn't. But um, we're going to start talking about the different ministry gifts. We're going to start describing what they are going over in the book of Corinthians 12. It talks about, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about some of the gifts of the Spirit. Over in the book of um, Ephesians 4, it talks about some of the gifts of the Spirit. And there are other places in the Bible where it talks about gifts. Because, see, God gave ministry gifts to everybody. And some people don't know what their gift is. One person came to me, and, uh, and they, they told me, I don't know what my ministry gift is, but this is what I want to do. And so they didn't know if it was in the Bible or not. And so we'll deal with it and show you what the Bible says. 
And, and usually whatever your ministry gift is, God will give you a passion for that thing. Yes. He will. God ain't know how to call you to do something you just don't like want to do. See, with, with me, I don't want to go to Africa. I ain't got no desire to go there. I ain't got no desire to go to Israel. And ain't nothing wrong with nobody that want to go there, but I don't have no desire to do that. But I support other people yeah. that's doing it because I know it's a work that needs to be done. And so whatever God gives you to do, as a matter of fact, you see, I wanted to be a teacher whenever I was in high school. And uh, I went to college. And I went to college to be an accountant. You know I went to be a, why I went to be an accountant? Because my counselor told me accountants make more money than teachers. <laughs> at, at that particular time, a teacher's beginning salary, now I'll tell you how old I am, a teacher's beginning salary was $5,000 a year. That was a teacher's beginning salary. And an accountant salary was $11,000 a year. I said, hey, I want to be an accountant. But I didn't really want to. I wanted to be a teacher. But now I am what God called me to be. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm about to be teaching in the world in the school system. But that's why I'm a pastor teacher. I know what my anointing is. And I love doing what God called me to do. And when you love doing what God called you to do, you'll begin to become equipped for that. You'll start stirring the word of God and see what God says about that. And if you get to the point where you look around and you see these children and say, these children, they, they need some discipline. They, they, you the one need to be talking to them because God gave you a passion for that. You see paper on the ground and everybody walking around it except you. And you notice that. That's part of where your passion is. See? So no, and, don't, and, and no job is too small in the body of Christ. Paul talks about that. There are, some, there are some gifts that seem to be unnoticed in the background. And then there are some gifts that people up front, you see them up front. But everything needed if the people up front can't do nothing, if the people in the background are not doing what they're doing. So everybody's job is important, and you need to magnify your job. Paul said, my office is to the Gentiles, and he said, I, does, I, I magnify, he doth, I, I know y'all thought I was going to say does. He said, I doth magnify my office. So whatever God gave you to do, do it and be your best at that, whatever it is. All right, my time is up. We're going to stop right there, and I want to tell the folk on Facebook, YouTube, thank you for joining us. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you for joining us. Now, Evergreen, I need y'all to tell me something. I need about five people at least to tell me something that you heard tonight that stood out and was important to you. It might be something you already knew and was just stirred up and brought back. 